Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome back to another episode of New Books in Japanese Studies, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I am Jingyi Li from the University of Arizona. Today we're joined by Dr. Eric Rath and his new book, Oishi, The History of Sushi. It, it was published in May this year by Reaction Books. Uh, Eric is a professor of pre-modern Japanese history at the University of Kansas. In particular, he studies about pre-modern culinary history. Welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Jingyi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I imagine culinary history must be a rich and delicious field to study. What drew your attention to pre-modern Japanese food history? Well, first, my interest in food history came through a medieval European history class I had as a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Uh, this was a, a medieval history class, kind of a general survey, and the instructor uh, would bring up different topics every week. And one a series of weeks, he talked about food history. And uh, the nice thing about that is he would often bring a loaf of bread that he had baked or some sort of... Uh, a cake or a bottle of sherry to class. And I realized for the first time, wow, uh, food could be a topic for historians to study, one. And two, it has these great benefits. <laughs> you know, you get these <laughs> you get these uh, uh, snacks along with it. And, uh, you know, that sort of planted a seed in my mind. My dissertation was about a completely different topic. But then later on, as I was thinking about my next project, actually, as I was finishing up my dissertation, uh, I thought, well, food is a really interesting topic. I wonder what I can do with it. And that was more than 20 years ago. And I've continued on since then. That's, uh, that's a really good idea to bring extra materials of your, of your teaching contents to the classroom. I should pitch yeah, that I, to my advisor. He also teaches about food history. And I'm not going to mention the instructor's name because I don't think it was legal for him to bring a bottle to Sherry to class. So, but uh, it certainly <laughs> made an impression on us graduate students, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so sushi is now recognized by a lot of people around the world as a symbolic Japanese food. But your book says sushi's origin is not actually in Japan. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, I mean, as best as we know, sushi comes from China. There have been some theories that perhaps it originated someplace else from China, but uh, the earliest evidence we have of sushi uh, references to the Chinese character for sushi are from the third century before Common Era. Uh, And so that's what we see this term uh, that later is used to refer to sushi uh, first appear. And what its original meaning was, was some kind of fish with salt. So it's a preserved food. Well, about 300 AD, uh, common era, we see a a new character for sushi emerge, and that's fish and salt and rice. And in the same century, those two characters come together to mean the same thing. And when they go to Japan, uh, they're used interchangeably to indicate sushi, some sort of dish made with fish and salt and rice. But I, and I say rice, uh, the early recipes, if you read them I, closely, uh, there's some debate about this, but perhaps other grains were used besides rice. So we have to keep an open mind about that as well. Interesting. I, there, there are some points I want to uh, revisit later. But uh, when we think of modern day sushi, we think of rose, right? Or to be accurate, makizushi. Mm-hmm. It usually has seaweed wrapper rice yeah. that's usually seasoned with vinegar and some salt, seafood, um, and sometimes vegetables, or in the case of in the case of American sushi, maybe the whole rose deep fried. Um, yeah. Some places may add cream cheese and all, I, which I found quite bizarre when I first came here. But in the past, that was not how sushi was prepared. So what was the oldest sushi like? Right. If you go to a supermarket and you buy those maki sushi, the sushi rolls, uh, sometimes you can't even find the roll underneath all the toppings. There's some sort of fried stuff on top and there's lots of different sauces. And there's a thought that that might have been through some uh, influence of Chinese restaurants in the United States or from 
uh, South America. Uh, we're really not so certain, certain where those ideas come from, but they certainly resonate with the modern American uh, desire for food, for, for, our, for our taste preferences in, in, in the United States, for something that's uh, packing a punch calorie-wise and has a lot of uh, flavor. Uh, but the original sushi, you know, that those original sushi rolls, at least from the late 18th century on, or much more uh, pared down. You would have some rice, uh, some salt in that rice, perhaps some vinegar in that rice, and uh, there might be a, a naughty uh, wrapper for it. And the, the um, stuffing, if you will, was rather simple. Cucumber or uh, preserved gourd called campio, maybe egg, something like that. So it was very slim, slender, geometrical kind of food and rather inexpensive. It was a street food when it came out in the late 18th century in, in Edo, which we now call Tokyo. So quite similar, uh, but not, but, but different from the way it's evolved today from the, from the examples that we see in super, supermarkets, at least. And before it became a snack food, in, uh, in the 18th century, I think your book mentions that um, it was it was some well it, rather than a snack uh, it was it didn't even really use a lot of rice and it didn't even use a lot of vinegar it didn't even use seaweed wrap so right. how I mean, was the, yeah yeah so the, how did people early... make sushi? Right. The earliest uh, sushi, as best as we can guess, uh, didn't uh, didn't have any of that at all. Uh, the use of nori, the seaweed, is rather recent in sushi's long, long history. And before that, the earliest recipes, the ones that we can look to in Chinese texts uh, from the 7th century, uh, show sushi recipes, actually 6th century, uh, just having fish and salt and rice, and then some interesting flavorings were added as well, and, and sake too, to hasten the fermentation process. So the uh, advent of, of nori, that that's came quite later in sushi's long historical development. And when, when do you think they changed from using fish skin to wrap the rice to, to, to using seaweed? Yeah, you know, I think people tried a number of different things uh, to wrap up rice, and that alone is a sort of uh, interesting side question in Japanese history, the whole is history of, of wrapping things in rice. I mean, it probably goes back in, in Japan, at least, to the ancient times. You're making some kind of cooked grain, and you need to bring it from one place to another, so you put it in a leaf wrapper. And sometimes that leaf uh, can be uh, can add some 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 olfactory elements to the dish. Uh, but I think, you know, they, it was settled upon, at least in Edo, that nori seaweed was the preferred wrapper for sushi. But in other places in Japan today, they use a different kind of seaweed, kombu seaweed. So, for example, in Kochi Prefecture, they uh, use a kombu wrapper. Or in uh, Mie Prefecture, they use um, mustard green to wrap up sushi. So you don't necessarily have to have nori to wrap up your sushi. But these kind of like wrapped sushi, that, that's rather recent in, in sushi's long, long history. Uh, if, you, if you go back to the earliest examples, there's nothing wrapped at all. It's just a preserved food. It's put inside a wooden bucket, rice, salt, fish, and that's it. And time, that was the other element. Just waiting months, perhaps years until the sushi is ready. That's um, quite interesting. How does this kind of food preparation relate to the geographic and climate conditions of that time? Um, and you mentioned some of the different, uh, the, the regional difference of how sushi was prepared. And I think at one point in your book, you mentioned that rather than using seafood, like nowadays, when pe when uh, you go to high-end sushi restaurants, uh, they, they would use um Ur ur urchin or um, crab, those kind of expensive seafoods. But I think uh, you mentioned that they used a lot of um, lake fish. 
Right, right. S yeah, uh, but maybe right, it, it might so be helpful to it might be helpful to talk about the brief briefly about the history of sushi in Japan and to kind of lay out uh, the development as we understand it. And the, the one of the challenges of writing a history of sushi is we don't have any archaeological evidence per se. I mean, there's some uh, wooden labels that exist from the eighth century that indicate sushi was traded or exchanged. Uh, but we don't have any recipes really until the 17th century for sushi, but we do have textual references. And so we can kind of piece together what kind of sushi was being made in Japan. So the earliest type of sushi in Japan is a type called nare sushi, which is that uh, most simplest form that I talked about earlier, rice, fish, and salt. And it's placed inside a container. And then through lactic acid fermentation, over months, sometimes years, that uh, fish is preserved, it's turned into a preserved food. The flavor profile completely changes. It becomes a lot sour, much more, more sour. Uh, the sweetness in the rice is extracted. The rice itself turns into a kind of uh, mush. And, and it's a very sour, but very, very flavorful uh, dish. But it takes time to do this. And so, one way to talk about the history of sushi is to talk about how people sped that process along. And initially, uh, the, it was just this element of time. But, you know, people get anxious. People, people want to eat their sushi right away. So they might have just uh, eaten it when it wasn't fully fermented. Or they could have uh, added things to hasten the fermentation process. So in the medieval period, we have reference, for instance, to sushi that's, you know, uh, eaten when it's not fully fermented. Namanare sushi is what it's called. Now, it's pr probably true that people long before this wouldn't wait for their food sushi to be done after two or three months or a year and eat it before that. But, but the first textual references we have is to this is in the medieval period, uh, 14th, 15th century. In the early modern period, when we get into the 17th century, then people are really understanding how to hasten the process. They add all kinds of things to facilitate fermentation. They add koji, which is a wonderful precursor for sake, and it has so many wide culinary uses in Japan. Fantastic uh, product. That can facilitate fermentation. Or they might add vinegar, and that's how sushi is made today. So most of that sushi rice that we have today, it's, it's flavored with salt, it's flavored with vinegar, it's flavored with sugar too. Uh, and so th that's one way to tell the story from those, from those ancient sushi that have none of that to all these added ingredients that are added to the rice to hasten the fermentation process, to turn something that was made that took year, months, if not years to make into something that could be made in a day or right in front of you if you're in a sushi bar today. As for regional differences in sushi, yeah, there are so many. Uh, that's, that's a huge topic. And a lot of them, you know, uh, are, are quite well known today. I mean, the Japanese government does a great job of promoting regional foodways, as it should. Uh, and some of them have disappeared over time. Uh, people made sushi for two reasons. One, because it tasted different and tasted good. And it was a preserved food. And when refrigeration became more available in people's houses, then there was less of a need to preserve food. So a lot of these traditional dishes that were based upon food preservation, uh, unfortunately, died away. You know, uh, weren't, weren't so popular anymore. And but but nonetheless, in Japan, there's a, a strong tradition of of local foodways. There was a revival of, of local food in the 1980s. And today, too, uh, local communities are doing what they can to preserve and promote those local types of sushi. So that's one of the joys of going to Japan is trying all those various types. Uh, in particular, like Kochi Prefecture has, has a lot of marvelous types of sushi. And you think that these would be on the coast. No, but actually up in the hills and the, in these villages, people uh, were very uh, skillful at preserving fish that came to them, whether they caught wild uh, in streams, and then they would make their own sort of... Uh, Fresh, freshwater sushi. Now that you mention, um, I'm curious if you found any difference um, in how people would eat fish 
within the same region, but depending on their distance from the ocean or from water. So, for example, you mentioned that up in the hills,、uh, people had lots of different ways to preserve fish, and I would imagine that's probably because well, they were, they were in the hills, and the fish would have gone bad if they didn't preserve it. But if they were closer to the sea or to the lake, would they have? Were there any records that indicated they would have eaten fresh fish? Well, yeah. I mean,、um, your access to fish really totally depends on your geography. And up until the 1950s, even communities that lived several miles from the coast didn't have access to coastal seafood. The type of fish they would have available would be freshwater fish. So things like carp and crucian carp and sweetfish, called ayu in Japanese.、Uh, so yes, it really depended a lot on geography, on what type of fish was used. Now, if you're in a coastal region, and you're in a fishing community, of course you have a lot of different types of fish to choose from. But maybe some of those、uh, really nice fish you want to bring to market. You don't want to use yourself. <laughs> you'll sell those rather than than eat them yourself. You'll you'll eat something else. So just because the fish was there doesn't mean necessarily that the people would consume it. They might they might sell it、uh, because it might be worth more to them that way. Wow, that, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Okay. When nowadays sushi is, is seen as a somewhat luxurious food, comparatively speaking, compared compared to I guess pizza or hamburgers, but in the Tokugawa period they were not that precious as your research finds. Can you talk more about this aspect? Yeah, I think you know you have a couple different types of sushi in the Tokugawa period. We also call it the early modern period, sixteen hundred to eighteen sixty-eight. You have those old types of fermented sushi, and I think those are considered valuable. There are stores that produce those because you don't want to. A lot of people didn't want to do that at home. They didn't have the resources. Sometimes producing these sushi that require months to create.、Uh, They they start smelling, you know, they're fermenting. So not everybody wants to have that in their house. So there was so there were some dedicated sellers who who would make these types of fermented sushi, and that was probably a, a more expensive thing to purchase in the market. But later on, the types of sushi that we know today, the the sushi rolls, the nigiri sushi, which consists just of the fish on top of rice,、uh, those were street foods. Those were inexpensive things that people would purchase from a stand. And eat while standing. That was the traditional way of eating、uh, sushi. This nigiri sushi in the 19th century. I mean, there were a few expensive sit-down restaurants,、uh, but by and large, if you wanted to have sushi in Edo, you would go queue up to a stand and look at the selection and order it, and then have it made for you. And the sushi would be quite big. You know, nowadays we get if we order sushi. Say at a conveyor belt place, you get two little pieces, right? And you know sometimes these pieces get smaller and smaller、uh, as the as the cost of living increases. At least that's been my experience going to to a restaurant, you know, again and again. But、uh, back in the Edo period, the, they were quite large pieces. They were about two and a half times. The size of your typical nigiri sushi today, so it's quite a, quite more than a mouthful, you know, quite quite a, quite a toothsome thing to to consume, and you'd get with just one of those, and you'd sit there and you'd snack, and、uh, there might be some a little bit of wasabi for you to use, maybe some soy sauce for you to dip in as you stood there and you munched this this sushi, kind of the way people might stop at a fast food restaurant and pick up a hamburger today. It's the same idea. You. You're eating it like on the go. You're eating it in your car. Of course, back in the Edo period, they didn't have cars, but they're moving. It's a culture in motion, and this was a food that you could take with you.、Uh, you had to take it with you because there was no place to to sit down and consume it. And that was the norm for sushi restaurants,、uh, many of them, until、uh, the until World War II. So in Tokyo, people would go to a, a small place. Uh, in say in Asakusa, there would be a lot of stand-up sushi places, and you have people writing books about sushi in this period, the 1920s, 1930s, and saying, you know, the best place for sushi is one of these stand-up joints, where you just go and、uh, stand and and enjoy enjoy the spectacle 
of the street and enjoy all the sushi that's available for you. And you get there early <laughs> before rather than late in the day because it's all being kept preserved by by, by uh, ice. So uh, sushi's really transformation into a gourmet food happens in the post-war period. Uh, that's when you, I mean, today you, you, you could spend a phenomenal amount of money for a sushi dinner. But uh, that would have been quite uh, unusual in the before before World War II, with the exception of a couple restaurants in Tokyo and elsewhere. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating topic that I'd like to come back to the transition of sushi between the uh, pre-modern and modern period. But uh, in the book, you introduced many recipes from pre-modern sources. From these recipes, do you observe any changes from the ancient to the medieval period? And what about into the pre-modern period? Right. Um, well, the way I use the word pre-modern is everything before the, the Meiji Restoration in 1868. So that would include medieval and it would include early modern. And uh, the recipes that we do have really all date from the 17th century. So they're all early modern. But we can use some of the earliest ones to surmise what medieval sushi was like. And we say recipes, but people who look at these today will de- be disappointed because they're, uh, they're, they don't provide all the things that we want in a recipe. They don't repl- provide all the exact measurements. They don't provide cooking times. You know, they, don't, they often do, don't even tell you how to make the rice. They're just sort of bare bones uh, information that serves two purposes. One, it's meant for the professional as a reminder for them what to do. Or two, it's a type of fiction. It's for a general reader who kind of wants to get gets an idea, someone who wants to get an idea about the food, but would never in a million years make it themselves. They might tell their servant to make it for them. So cookbook authors, in other words, didn't really necessarily have to worry about people actually reproducing their recipes, which is a frustration for us reading them today. Uh, you know, I, many people have said to me, well, gosh, well, what's, what's, well, you know, tell me some more information about this. I mean, what, what, uh, what more can we know? And I, as a historian, I can't make things up. You know, I just sort of shrug my head and I say, well, uh, you know, just it's anybody's guess. And if you know something about cooking, uh, then, well, you, you probably can f- figure a few of them out. Uh, better than than somebody who doesn't know anything about cooking. But there's a wide variety of recipes in in, in the book, and some of them are, are recent. Some of them are uh, our own creation. Uh, my wife chiefly had, had contributed some recipes, and these work. Uh, these these are written well, and I testify that we've we've tested them many many times, and they've they turn out really well. And you can make them even in Kansas. So. That's that's pretty cool. Um, what were some of the most commonly seen ingredients in sushi of the Tokugawa period? Well, um, it really depends on the type of sushi because the old school fermented type of sushi. I mean, there are people use a lot of freshwater fish, a lot of carp, uh, crucian carp. That's very famous today as a type of um, fermented sushi, funazushi from Shiga. Uh, and then later on in, in the Edo period, if we're talking about nigiri sushi, the, the surprising thing from what we can know f- from cookbooks written in the early 20th century that provide some indication about Edo period sushi, we know that the fish is not raw necessarily. It's been boiled. It's been simmered. It's been uh, preserved in vinegar. So it's not necessarily raw fish that they're putting on top of nigiri sushi. And most of the fish is rather small fish. So this whole fascination with fatty tuna, you know, tuna is a huge uh, predatory fish. And that's really post-war when people started eating tuna sushi. I mean, there's some, some examples of that before the war. But really, if you're a sushi seller before World War II, and you don't have access to refrigeration, there's no way you want to buy a huge tuna. Well, what are you going to do with it? So you're going to buy small fish. And those, you know, you can cut up and you can serve to your customers. But a tuna, that you know, it, just, it would just go bad on you, you know. 
So um, now I've forgotten your question, but <laughs> uh, ingredients. Right. Yeah. So that that's what struck me. Commonly is used that, ingredients. Yes. Is that uh, we we see fish that have bit, that are smaller fish and that are um, ones that you know don't need to be refrigerated and that ones and that ones have been treated in a certain way, like simmering or or allowed to sit in vinegar for several hours and things like that. Um. So the what I learned most from your book actually is how much about sushi is actually a modern convention so for example when you mentioned tuna um when i was a graduate student in japan i was constantly told by my senpai that if i go to a sushi restaurant i must eat otoro the, the fatty part mm. i cannot i must not order the, the 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 normal part because it would show that i lack taste Oh. In, in in sushi, but like you said earlier, it's it's it wasn't really a thing back in the Tokugawa period. It's all post Meiji Restoration, right? And and I think actually post World War Two is when people really when tuna really took off uh, for for sushi. Uh, yeah, you know the the thing about the history of sushi. The one thing that I really would say about it is that. Sushi's constantly been changing. You can't really point to a time and say, this is the time, this is the place when sushi was authentic. Uh, anybody who does that, you have to look at them askance because it's always been been changing. It's constantly evolving. It's evolving today. You have sushi burritos, sushi pizza, sushi bagel, you name it. So there's all kinds of sushi products. Uh, you know, whether a person likes them or not, I mean, it's, that's a matter of personal choice, but, uh, if the, if this history of sushi has taught us one thing is that it's a constantly evolving dish and it's, it's an anonymous dish too. You know, I mean, uh, we, we can't point to a, a single individual and say this person invented this style of sushi, even something as recent as the California roll, you know, something that was invented 50 years ago. Uh, we don't know who invented it. Yeah, it's probably invented in uh, little Tokyo in LA, but exactly which restaurant, exactly which chef, for what reason? I mean, who knows? It's sort of lost in uh, the, the sands of time. And I think that's okay. You know, I, I think there's so often we try to pinpoint one individual as the creator of something. And that's that's a long tendency, too, in Japanese food histories. They'll say, this is the person who invented this dish. And it's oftentimes some warlord <laughs> who is probably not thinking about food at all. Uh, but I think we have to recognize that sushi is one of the great anonymous world cuisines now. Yes, that's a really good point. And it kind of ties into my next question. So the Meiji Restoration brought a lot of changes to Japanese people's lives and their diet, too. Since the late Tokugawa period, they began to be exposed to new ingredients like beef and dairy. Um, and then after the Meiji Restoration, like in your book, uh, you mentioned how, 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 this, how sushi it used to be such a street food, but then it was gradually turned into a high-end gourmet thing. Um, so during this process, was any of the diet changes reflected in sushi making and similar foods? Th that's a big question because the diet really does change in that Meiji period uh, when Japan is uh, changing so much in terms of its politics and society uh, and, and its food ways. So Meiji from 1868 to 1912, uh, there's lots of, of Western influences that come in. You have fried foods, you have curry come into Japan, you have different types of confectionery, beer, um, all sorts of things come to Meiji. And you do see, if you look at some Meiji recipes for sushi, an effort to try to adapt sushi to those trends. So for example, I include in my book a meat sushi that can be made with any kind of meat and black pepper instead of wasabi. Uh, sushi 
as a food evolves in this period, uh, the restaurant culture is really, really vibrant in the 1920s, especially. And you have people who are writing about food in that period who help popularize certain restaurants. So you have these uh, gourmet guides that come out in that period to tell people about where to eat sushi. And I think that also has an impact on how consumers viewed sushi. Uh, they see it in a different light. It's not just some sort of uh, fast food of the early modern period. There's, there's, there's some skill to it. They understand. They understand that there are levels of quality to it. There's, they learn new ways to appreciate sushi and more people can eat sushi too in the Meiji period because traditionally restaurants were a male preserve in the early Meiji years. And before that men would go to restaurants and women didn't often have the chance to go to restaurants, but at the beginning of the 20th century, department stores start opening up uh, food areas, uh, dining rooms for women, for children, and they start serving sushi. So people who have a new type of audience has an opportunity to try sushi for the first time. Uh, maybe they've had it at home, but they could try a different version when they dine out at a department store. So sushi becomes a little more egalitarian uh, in, in the 1920s and uh, 1930s, more people have an opportunity to eat professionally made sushi. Uh, wartime, of course, changes the situation completely uh, in so many different ways. Uh, one way is that uh, with, with Tokyo facing so much destruction, uh, people say the lot of chefs left uh, Tokyo and spread around the country, spreading this old school uh, Edo style sushi of the nigiri sushi, magizushi throughout Japan. I mean, that, and that's probably true to some extent, although it's not well documented. Um, but after the war, sushi stands were prohibited. You couldn't serve sushi outdoors in the setting that it had uh, been, you know, had had been uh, had been served for 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 centuries. You couldn't do that. It was prohibited. It was considered to be unsanitary. Never mind the fact that people are doing the same thing with ramen and other types of food. They're serving them outdoors. But sushi, since I guess it's raw fish, you, you couldn't do it. So sushi restaurants had to uh, rethink themselves and uh, invest more in a seating area, invest more in an actual uh, uh, environment where people would consume within the restaurants. And I think that helped to scale up sushi in terms of, of its uh, in how people viewed it. It was no longer a street food. It was something you would you know, go to a restaurant for. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't sort of uh, lower end versions of it because conveyor belt sushi starts off as a standing, uh, standing operation. People would go and uh, stand at the restaurant and watch the conveyor belt with the sushi go around. And it was only later after the conveyor belt was added that uh, the owner thought, ah, oh, let's put down some chairs here <laughs> so the customers will stay a little bit longer. Uh, so there's still that kind of uh, uh, difference in, 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 in sushi restaurants from a very high level ones to, to ones that serve a, a different category of customer at a lower level. I was going to ask you about conveyor belt sushi because I love conveyor belt sushi. Um... I, I love, I, uh, well, I love the price. I love how, well, I kind of like how small they're serving. So, so I get to try different kinds. I also love the gacha game they would have. So, so, so every five plays you get to uh, play a gacha game. Oh, uh, yeah. So you mentioned, yes. So you mentioned that conveyor belt sushi was considered a bit of a lower end um, way of eating sushi. And Actually, um, when I was in Japan, I was my my uh, senpai would laugh at me when I learned that I would go to convey about sushi ah. to get sushi. So, do you think this um, kind of hierarchy between sushi between different kinds of sushi restaurants still exists nowadays? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the conveyor belt sushi—it's fun to sit there. Uh, anybody can go. You don't have to go with a group. You can go by yourself. You can just have as much as you want. You know how much it costs because of the color of the plate. And it's convenient. It's quick. And it's fun. And even at some places, there are these little games, like you said, you get 
you eat five plates, you throw them in a hole, and you win a prize. Well, there, in terms of, of quality and price point, there is a great difference between conveyor belt sushi and um, going to a sushi restaurant. I mean, conveyor belt sushi, the fish was pre-cut before it arrived at the restaurants. Uh, there's really, at many of these places, not a lot of skill. Uh, and indeed, it's it's all done by, by machine. The sushi is made by machine. Uh, and that would not, of course, be the case when you go to a, a sushi bar. You're going to be sitting down and perhaps having a conversation with the chef. And that individual will, will suggest some things. And you often know, won't know what the price of it <laughs> until, it's, until it's over with, uh, depending on the place. So in terms of quality, definitely going to a real sushi restaurant is the, the way to go. But in terms of convenience, I mean, yes, uh, sushi, conveyor belt sushi has its, uh, has its merits, I suppose. And this ties, ties with something you mentioned earlier. So this whole idea about um, sushi chefs being craftsmen, for example, we always see in documentaries that to become a sushi chef, you have to spend five years washing rice mm. first and then spend another five years cooking um, egg rolls. Yeah. And then maybe you get to um, cut fish or something. Yeah. So this whole idea of sushi, uh, sushi chefs being craftsmen, I would imagine it didn't exist in the Edo period if if they could just open a store on the streets. So when did this become a thing that sushi chefs were so highly respected and highly um, specialized in what they do? You know, I think part of the story with that is a changed understanding of the word craftsman. Because if you look at some sushi books written by sushi professional, professionals at the beginning of the 20th century, they use this term craftsman in a very pejorative sense. And I'm, we're using the term shokunin. We, nowadays, you say craftsman, and that we associate that word with artisanal, with high quality. It's very positive meaning. But at the beginning of the 20th century, that was used in a derogatory way to refer to people who didn't have skills, who just opened up a sushi stand and, and read some recipes in a book or wherever and started making sushi. So the whole idea of, of craftsmen and sushi being something that's created by craftsmen, that's very, very recent, I think. But there's also the story of the professionalization of the cooking trade and of, of chef's licenses. And if you want to call yourself a, a, a sushi chef, you have to go through a licensing uh, process today. But that doesn't mean you can't open a restaurant. You or I could go to Japan, and as long as we followed the local health codes, we could open a sushi restaurant. But we just couldn't call ourselves, we couldn't legally call ourselves sushi chefs unless we passed some government-administered exams at the prefectural or the national level. Um, and, and I think, you know, does it matter? Uh, it really depends on, on the type of sushi you're, you're making. I mean, some people, they come through a culinary school background and they're highly trained, they're high, highly certified, and that's great. And they do great sushi. Other people uh, are trained, you know, because their dads were sushi chefs. So their, their, their mothers were actually in the trade. And usually it's a family business, you know. Oftentimes we think of men being the chefs and that's true to a large extent, but women are equally important in the restaurant. You know, they're the ones who are are handling some of the foods, putting doing some of the food preparation, interacting with customers. They're equal partners, uh, and I think that's been the case for for a long time. But I mean, lately we've seen more women being sushi chefs, but that doesn't mean that women weren't involved in the restaurant trade uh, long before that. Uh, so yes, sushi certification that's rather new, and uh, also even even more recent is being able being a, a Westerner and going to Japan and being involved in something like a sushi Olympics or a sushi training course and becoming some kind of sushi samurai or whatever the title is. And that's great. People can get that kind of training uh, if they're interested in this, this day and age. Yes, it's quite funny to watch the 
the the other um, relevant concepts around sushi evolve. And um, the recognition of sushi as Japan's national food sounds suspicious now, now that we understand where sushi came from and how drastically it has changed over the centuries. So why do you think sushi, among all the numerous kinds of Japanese food, like, I don't know, ramen and tempura and soba, maybe, or udon, I love udon, why mm. why sushi? Why did sushi become such a cultural symbol? What are the deeper implications of the um, cultural and perhaps economic dynamics behind it? Right, that's a really complex question. And when we talk about uh, national foods in Japan, I mean, what I think of is the 2013 UNESCO certification of washoku, or Japan's traditional dietary cultures. And if you read what exactly was certified, it's quite ambiguous. There's really no specific food mentioned in that definition of washoku, except for rice. And rice is mentioned several times. And, you know, the, whether rice was a part of the diet for most people in Japan, that's a very interesting question that we could talk about. But I think part of the reason why sushi is such a symbol of Japanese food culture is that rice element to it, at least for some sushi. At least the sushi we know today, it always has rice in it and not just any rice, but very nice rice, right? This rice that's also referred to as like the relics of the Buddha. That's one of the ways of referring to sushi rice as shuddy, as like Buddhist relics, you know? Yeah. So uh, there's a whole fascination. There's a whole veneration of, of rice in Japanese culture, uh, notwithstanding the fact that most people didn't eat rice until the 1960s. And rice consumption in Japan is half of what it was in the 1960s. So it keeps going down, 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 down. And I think one of the reasons why the Japanese government is so keen on promoting washoku and other rice foods is to support domestic rice farmers, uh, which are important to its political base. And these people deserve to be supported because it's a very challenging profession, farming anywhere. Anywhere farming is a challenging profession. So uh, rice and sushi, they go hand in hand uh, in, in recently, and I think also in academic writings about sushi, because oftentimes Japanese scholars will say, well, when did sushi come to Japan? It came with the arrival of rice. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. We don't know. I mean, that's, a, that's a nice theory. That assumes, though, that sushi was made with rice, but we have examples from ancient China where it's not made with rice. So who knows? But I, I think, you know, ra ra sushi is really intertwined with rice more so than those other dishes that you mentioned, more so than ramen, which relies on wheat, or udon, which is on, relies on wheat, or, or soba, which is buckwheat, or, or what have you. Fascinating. And I guess, um, so in the last part of your, of your book, you mentioned how important sushi is or sushi culture is in the globalization of Japanese culture, how it has become such an important part in Japan's, um, well, the expansion of Japanese culture in other parts of the world, how it's being accepted into other cultures and adapted and arranged into their own unique culture and um, made into, well, what they call fusion. Can you talk more about this um, aspect? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the characteristics of sushi is that it's constantly changing, constantly adapting. And of course, the star example of that is the California roll that, you know, may have been made, it, made specifically to appeal to uh, white Americans, or maybe it was made because uh, someone didn't have fish that day and they relied on avocado and pollock and mayo. Uh, so, yeah, sushi is constantly evolving, and sushi became prominent in the United States right at the time as Japanese culture was becoming prominent in the 1980s. So you have uh, the television show Shogun, you have uh, Japanese economic prowess in the 1980s, the con Japanese economy is taking off. Uh, Japanese are, the economy is always in the media in those days, and people are are turn and and they look and see what 
you know, Japanese are eating and sushi is upheld as some sort of quintessential Japanese dish. And that's what a lot of the food critics are saying. You know, they're saying, this is the national dish of Japan. You have to have sushi. Uh, that's a nice promotion for sushi, isn't it? That it's the national dish of Japan. Never mind the fact that most people don't eat sushi every day in Japan, that it's something for special occasions. Uh, and there's so many different varieties of it as well that it's hard to say that there's one type of sushi that's a national dish. But when it's promoted in the 1980s in North America, that's what people are saying is that it's Japan's national dish. You want, you want to understand what the Japanese are like, eat sushi. That's what a lot of critics are saying in a, in a nutshell. And then that rise to prominence in North American culture uh, inspires uh, the similar thing in the 1990s in Europe. So you have sushi take off in Germany and the UK at that time, uh, sushi restaurants opening and booming and doing business. And of course, people want to eat sushi in a way that they, uh, that they like it. You know, they want, uh, they want that pow flavor, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's, that's one of the things I, uh, one of the takeaways that I have of watching a lot of American food television is someone takes a bite of something and it's always an exclamation point when they react to it. It's pow, bang, you know? Uh, and that's the type of sushi that we see in supermarkets. It's that high fat, high salt, high spicy sushi, the, the, the spicy mayo, the wasabi, mayonnaise, whatever. It, it really, like, it's an assault on your palate, and people like that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's quite far removed from the very simple sushi of Japan. But of course, now that type of sushi, that American style sushi, those uh, California rolls are being, have been re imported to Japan, and you find them on conveyor belt sushi restaurants and other places too. Yeah, that's um, that's quite interesting. Although I still can't get used to the kind of sushi here in the supermarkets that have um, uh, sriracha and mayonnaise on top of it, plus jalapeno, plus I don't know chili powder and all sorts of stuff. Well, clearly there's but, a market uh, for it, you know. Yeah. I mean, clearly, yeah. uh, <laughs> the people who make that understand the consumers. That's what people want. Yeah. And I think what Consumers might want to ask, though, is let's take a look at the ingredients and the calories and the sodium and the fat. And I do that in my book. I survey some local supermarket sushi, and it just it's totally surprised me. First of all, you can't find that information often, often on the package. If you go to the supermarket and you pick up the sushi, there's no ingredients label. There's no breakdown of calories. So you go online. And, you know, there are some examples that are very healthy. You can get a cucumber roll, right? And that's that's really healthy to pick up. But these other ones, you know, crunchy, mayo, Philadelphia cream cheese, something, something roll. I mean, those have more carbohydrates uh, th than a Big Mac, some of them, or a McDonald's hamburger. And they have more sodium than those things too, than those fast foods. And that's even before you start dipping it in soy sauce. So I think people need to be careful about the supermarket, the sushi that they buy. I mean, by all means, enjoy that. But just don't, be, don't make the mistake that sushi is a health food just because it's sushi. You know, oftentimes you'd be better off eating a Big Mac, I think. Or just because it's from Japan. It would probably be nice if someone writes a book to demystify um, how our Japanese food is healthy. Uh, I mean, Japanese food is healthy. I think, by and large. But, I mean, any any type of food can be healthy. It's just a matter of quantity and uh, the types of ingredients that you use and amounts. I mean, oftentimes it seems that, you know, amount is so important for people. Like, oh, I got so much to eat at this restaurant. Well, um, that's good. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there are other dimensions too to consider when we're thinking about dining out and and especially when we think about the health effects of food rather than just amount. Um, but I think, yeah, we can all learn a lot from different regional food ways, Japanese food ways, American food ways, and, and how to eat better. And um, that's what I think one of the most important things that food history can teach us is it can teach us to 
think critically about what we eat because what we eat is is becomes us we we internalize it and we become what we eat we are what we eat right so uh it's our job to kind of focus in on see see what this is where does it come from and and think about it and interrogate it a little bit and 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 make this make make sound choices that are not just healthy for us but healthy for the environment and that's especially true and important for sushi that's really well said. That's the perfect punchline for today's interview. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Oh, well, it's been my pleasure. Uh, I, I don't know if that was a punchline per se, but <laughs> a tagline, let's just say. Uh, but uh, I, I hope you aren't laughing. Anyway, it's been a real pleasure. <laughs> I, I love to talk about Japanese food. And uh, I really enjoyed our conversation today, Jingyi. Thank you. Thank you. And for our listeners to learn more about sushi and Japanese food, check out Oishi, The History of Sushi by Eric Rath. This is Xing Yi from New Books in Japanese Studies. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, goodbye.